Thanks. So I have been given the, the wonderful task of being able to talk to you about uh, testosterone and prostate cancer and high risk disease and prevention of recurrence. Next. So the history of prostate cancer and testosterone is a varied and uh, complicated one. In, in 1941, <clears throat> Dr. Huggins and uh, Dr. Hodges did some bench work and they figured out that and we're not, it's not really clear to me how we thought of this, but they thought that maybe if we reduce the testosterone uh, in these men who would present with metastatic prostate cancer to the bone, that they would get improvement. And they su subjected these men at that point to the only way we could get the testosterone down was castration. Next. And because of this work, uh, in 1966, they won the Nobel Prize in medicine, next. But it was at this point that you would have to say when you look back that there was the, the truth and the myth. So the, the truth was is that in widely metastatic prostate cancer, testosterone was to maybe use a euphemism, the, the enemy, you wanted to get rid of testosterone. <clears throat> and the thought process beyond that point was that Testosterone must be bad the whole time. Next. So historically, there was always this feeling that uh, a low testosterone was better, high testosterone could lead to prostate cancer, and there was a, sort of an undue fear of exacerbating the disease because of that. However, um, we've also known that the testosterone is very important for muscle support. And there are a lot of problems when men do become very low testosterone or hypogonadal. So what happened to me actually that brought my attention to testosterone is in the 2005 to 2008 year, <clears throat> I was looking at men that were recovering from surgery the way we wanted uh, from a sexual point of view, sexual function point of view. And there was like a missing link. And I spoke with the editor of the journal of sexual medicine. And I said, do you think testosterone be good having some role in this? And he said, you know, you should be checking testosterone on every patient that you see. And I took him at his word. And uh, he also made a very important part that the total testosterone, in other words, just the regular testosterone was not what you needed to know. You had to know the free testosterone, which is the part of the testosterone that's not bound to protein and can get into the muscle and the blood and to other important structures like nerves and the brain. So we started to look at this and collect data on every patient. Next. So from June, uh, excuse me, from December of 2009 through June of 2018, we had 850 patients that we had data on and, and who had undergone a radical prostatectomy. On each man, we collected their total testosterone and then a sex hormone binding globulin. And with those two, you can calculate uh, what the free testosterone is. And then what happened is we had uh, 152 men that we, that we felt were low, nearly 20% of our, our population remarkably, and they were placed on testosterone replacement if you know, they had low risk disease, uh, pathologically confirmed to the prostate, you know, an undetectable PSA and a low baseline uh, three month levels. If they were below 0.57, then we would put them on it. That's the, uh, the bottom 25% <clears throat> quartile. And we were really mainly looking to see if that would help in the recovery of erection function, which is where I had initially noticed, you know, I don't understand why some of these guys are not recovering. Maybe it's low testosterone. Next. So the sum of our studies has shown a lot of very interesting things. We, we almost always hear that as men get older, the testosterone goes down and, and the red bush here with, <clears throat> with the black line going straight across indicates that actually the total testosterone as men go, if you can see it's from age 40 to age 80 at the bottom down here, uh, that it's really pretty flat. There's, there isn't that uh, finding that as men get older, the testosterone goes down. However, if you go down to this, the, the blue, <clears throat> check box down here, you can see that the line is actually going up and that's the sex hormone binding globulin. And what happens is now, if you just go to the green box over here, you can see that the free testosterone, which is the active component, 
goes down as men age. So that's where the truth that it is. And if we, if you really want to know how patients are doing, you have to get the free testosterone. And the best way to do the free testosterone actually is to calculate it. It's such a small um, molecule that to do it directly, it's not as accurate as if you take these larger molecules and actually calculate it. So um, we've been collecting this data, and this is what we led to the next findings. Next slide. So interestingly, uh, just on sexual function, we found out that as men age from 40 to 60, as their uh, <clears throat> free testosterone goes down, as you can see, the, the free testosterone is going down here. <clears throat> the, the impact on the, this IIEF5, which is a, it's a sexual function metric, and it, it was marginal, almost no, no change at all. So men, their, their free testosterone would go down, but we didn't see any real issues with uh, sexual function in the uh, <clears throat> native loss of sexual function. But then remarkably, if you just continue to follow them from 60 to 80, you can see that uh, it, it becomes much more functional. And we're not exactly sure why that is, but as men go <clears throat> from 60 to 80, there is a significant drop in sexual function as, as the free testosterone goes down. So it, it seems like probably it's, it's a really long period of time and sexual function doesn't get impacted much in the 60s, but somewhere around the late 50s and early 60s, there's a big change and it really starts to make a big difference. So it, it really says that you have to measure the free testosterone in these gentlemen. You can't really ask them for symptoms. You have to measure it. And, and technically that has just never really been done. Next. So then what else did we find? <clears throat> Interestingly enough, as you can see, the, as the free testosterone in this arrow goes down, the aggressiveness of the cancer, which is the grade, the aggressiveness goes up dramatically. So the lower the free testosterone, the higher <clears throat> risk disease that they would have. And this slide also just did a similar sort of thing. This was a stage and you could also see that as the free testosterone went down, the uh, stage went up. Next. Lastly, on, on, in, the, in this form of, the, <clears throat> of our analysis, we also just looked at you know, what kind of a difference it would make in the, rec in the recurrence of prostate cancer is based on the PSA. So after we do the surgery, the way we know how the recurrence is happening or not is if they have a, what we call a non-detectable uh, PSA, which is less than zero, basically less than 0 0.05, or it's a very low PSA. And you can see that um, for men with higher um, free testosterone, <clears throat> they had a lower recurrence. And the red line is the guys who, uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, the, the blue line is, is the guys who had the lower testosterone and they had a higher recurrence rate as compared to the red line. So it, it also uh, impacted the men after surgery. If they had low testosterone, it, it appeared to increase the risk of having the cancer come back, which would make sense because it was making the cancers more aggressive. And so that, that's what you would expect next. So we started replacing uh, <clears throat> testosterone. And these are, uh, this is taken from some publications we've had in the British Journal. And, but one of the main things that there was a major concern about, and we're, which has been a, a long term, if you listen or talk to most doctors, they would say, well, you know, prostate cancer is turned on by <clears throat> testosterone. And it looks like actually it's just the opposite that is the case. So um, in this uh, <clears throat> graph here on the left-hand side, you can see that it, in the men that we supplemented them uh, with their testosterone replacement, we, we reduced the recurrence rate by 53%. Next. And the other thing that we learned is if they were destined to recur, there, you know, the red is, <clears throat> is the men that were on replacement it delayed the recurrence. So it prevented and delayed um, the recurrence in prostate cancer. Again, all in line, and, and it, it's uh, a very significant sign that men with high testosterone uh, tend to be a bit better fit. Next. So <clears throat> you can see that uh, we, we've already discussed and we know for sure that once the cancer becomes metastatic, sort of late in the disease process, um, we got to get rid of the testosterone. But in the 
in the early period leading up to it, there's evidence to suggest that it, it is just the opposite. Next. So in this slide, you can see that there have been a lot of publications, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but one of the most important uh, studies here in the bottom is that they took a very large <clears throat> population of 500,000 men, uh, and they were able to find out if, if they were in the highest category of getting the injections, uh, shot injections, versus the lowest uh, <clears throat> category of, of just one to two, and the other one they had greater than 12 they showed that the guys who had less um, testosterone replacement uh, had a 33% uh, <clears throat> association with increased risk of developing prostate cancer. So it appears too that men with low testosterone will increase the risk of getting prostate cancer and they will increase the risk of having more aggressive prostate cancer. Next. So if you want to kind of think of it as sort of a scheme, you can see uh, as these wheels uh, are trying to demonstrate as uh, <clears throat> testosterone deficiency happens, you know, you start to get into this level of hypogonadism and the consequence of that is it causes metabolic syndrome. Uh, there's increased uh, loss of muscle mass. So there's increased weight in the midsection of the abdomen, increased blood sugars, all leading to the development and making the cancer worse. But once it gets to a point where the cancer has become metastatic, it's not as concerned about the metastatic, um, excuse me, the metabolic component of the syndrome. It, it flips over to genetic. So it looks like in, in the, the vast majority of the time in prostate cancer, low testosterone, you want to, you want to correct. But if it does, if it is late and delayed, then you, you do have to go to castration or castrating, temporarily castrating medications. So it's, it's a, you know, really a tale of two cities. Next. So <clears throat> the, the, what we've really learned that low testosterone is not uh, determined accurately by the total. So you can't just have a total testosterone. You have to get the free testosterone. And you do that through the sex hormone binding globulin. We've learned that <clears throat> low uh, free testosterone doesn't tend to impact the men much um, below the age of 60, but once you get above 60, it does. And it also reduces the ability for the recovery of sexual function next. And <clears throat> our conclusions are that the low free T should be checked in all patients, especially men undergoing a radical prostatectomy. And you can see that the testosterone replacement is not something that makes things worse, it makes it better. Um, but you do have to be careful because if the patient gets into a higher risk disease category, then you know it may have to be stopped. Thank you.